Commission-free trading is the norm, but true value is more than a price tag. It's a team of traders to answer any question, a personalized education, and Thinkorswim's charting capabilities. Value is becoming smarter with every trade. TD Ameritrade, where smart investors get smarter. Which is harder to change? Someone's world or someone's mind? The idea of hosting a stranger in your home is probably not intuitive to most people. I never really set out to create any form of disruption. I really just set out to solve a problem. Failure is simply a learning opportunity, right? World Reimagined with Gotham Makunda, a leadership podcast for a changing world. An original podcast from NASDAQ. Women bring so many new perspectives, new points of view to the table. The creativity, the compassion, the collaboration. What could this be someday? An empty house has so much potential. Should the couch go here or over there? Uh, Do we want to put the big comfy armchair into that nice sunny corner? Or put the plant right in the window instead and see how big it can get? And well, I don't know what to make of all these weird tiny cabinets, but I'm sure there's something we can do with them. Of course, every new place has rooms with fairly specific uses. You probably shouldn't put a mattress in your kitchen, say, or a dining room table in the master bath. But for the most part, when it's a blank slate like this, a home could be anything. Even the beginning of a revolutionary business. First of all, this was a empty bedroom. It didn't even have a bed, but we set up an air bed. And instead of calling it a bed and breakfast, we called it air bed and breakfast. Nate Blacharzik is the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Airbnb. And when he and his roommates turned co-founders, Brian Chesky and Joe Gebbia started up in 2007, they weren't trying to change the hospitality industry as we know it. They just wanted to make a few bucks back on their rent over a busy weekend in San Francisco. But they were also paying close attention to what happened next. And we put up a simple blog post advertising, you know, very affordable accommodation for the weekend. And we actually got inquiries and three different individuals ended up staying there. One was a 35 year old woman from Boston. Um, Another was a father of four from Utah. And there was a man from India. And I guess we were expecting guys like ourselves, you know, guys in their twenties. And so we were immediately kind of struck by the fact that this was a diverse group, individuals with very different backgrounds than ourselves needing a place to stay. Once they stayed, we all hung out together. Joe and Brian introduced the guests to their friends, their networks. And so it ended up being not just a way to pay the rent or a way for them to save money and have a place to stay, but it really became this kind of social experience where friendships were formed. And so that was how it all got started. But from there, we thought, well, you know, this was such a a win-win. Maybe there are other people in other situations where the same arrangement might work. And we recognized, though, to do that, you know, we would have to overcome that stigma of how do you trust a stranger? And so that was, you know, really then when we focused in on solving that specific problem, but we've kind of stumbled into it, not because we had done a business analysis, but because we were solving our own problem. Nate and his co-founders had discovered a new way of thinking about unused space in their apartment. But in order to capitalize on it, they had to change the way people thought about strangers. In much the same way that this space could either be an office, a gym, or a spare bedroom you rent out for a little bit of extra cash, the world is full of people who could either trash your home if given half the chance, or become your new best friend. Changing the way people see each other was one of the first challenges Nate faced as a leader. It's not an easy one, especially when the person you want others to see differently is yourself. I think this was one of the most eye-opening stages in my journey because I always thought, you know, I was perhaps too young to create change, but I never saw it in action until this time. Samira Metha started leading coding workshops as an elementary schooler. Then she founded Coder Bunnies in 2016 at the age of eight, which for those following along makes her one year younger than that original Airbnb. 
she was motivated by a desire to share her passion for coding with people her own age. But she soon found out it was more than just her peers that she needed to persuade. I never thought that people would actually, you know, say no to me or they would reject me because of my age or because I'm a young girl. And so I had to learn about this sort of societal perception of young kids, of young girls, and I had to persist through that and I had to prove them wrong and I had to say that just because I'm seven, just because I'm a girl, it doesn't mean that I can't do something somebody older than me would per se be able to do. Even though they're in different fields and a handful of years apart, Nate and Samira absolutely have one thing in common. When it comes to being a leader, both of them are disruptive. It seems like every innovation and every company are described as disruptive nowadays, but that's actually far from the truth. Disruptive innovation was a theory created by Clay Christensen, and most things that are described as disruptive actually aren't. When we think of innovations, we think of faster computers or televisions with higher resolution. Those aren't disruptive. They're what Clay termed sustaining innovations technological improvements that enhance the types of performance that the market has historically rewarded. Sustaining innovations push the technological frontier outward. They are the bread and butter of what companies do. But disruptive innovations are very different. They usually perform worse at the characteristics the market has previously rewarded. But in exchange, they're less expensive, more convenient, or easier to use. Disruptive innovations don't appeal to the most demanding and most profitable customers. Instead, they appeal to low-end customers who don't need the higher performance provided by sustaining innovations. And over time, sustaining innovations allow these disruptive innovations to get better, appealing to more and more customers until they take over much or all of a market. Because disruptive innovations appeal, at least initially, to the least profitable customers, they pose an exceptionally difficult challenge for incumbent companies, which are focused on developing innovations to appeal to their most profitable customers. Airbnb is a classic disruptive innovation. When they first launched, if you could afford a nice hotel, you'd never consider an Airbnb. But if you couldn't afford a hotel, someone's couch was still a lot better than nothing. Then, over time, they moved up market. Samira's coding workshops are similar. They're not a course at MIT, but they're not supposed to be. Their audience is completely different and often overlooked. We often talk about disruption as something companies are trying to do, but it's more often the emergent result of their choices, not the goal they were working towards. When these two founders set out to start their businesses, being disruptive was far from the front of their minds. I truly believe that being able to change young people's attitudes and their mindsets towards computer science, I think through my inventions, is one of the most disruptive parts of my career. So, you know, the youth who once thought that coding was boring and hard are now developing real world solutions using the power of code because they enjoy it so much. So going back to what I said about my inventions, I invented Coder Bunnies, Coder Minds, and Coder Mars, and these are essentially board games that have simplified complex coding and AI concepts in mechanisms that kids as young as six years old can understand and and more importantly, enjoy. My board game Coder Bunny simplifies complex coding concepts. And, you know, these are concepts that could be as basic as sequencing, conditionals, functions, and repeat loops to more advanced concepts like stacks, queues, lists, parallelism, and inheritance. And Coder Mind, on the other hand, is the world's first ever board game that teaches the concepts of artificial intelligence. So through a fun adventure, AI concepts such as training, and inheritance and adaptive learning and autonomy are made more understandable. And then moreover, I would also consider disruption to be my integration of computer science and AI education in entertaining ways within schools and library systems across the world through the worldwide outreach that I've been able to carry out. So, you know, I've held over hundreds of workshops teaching thousands of kids how to code in exciting ways through my creations. And I believe that the real disruption is the accessibility and simplicity of coding and AI tools. And for myself, you know, 
Certainly, the idea of hosting a stranger in your home is probably not intuitive to most people. Certainly wasn't 14 years ago. You know, I think that the ultimate disruption here was creating the necessary trust to build a, a real industry around this. You know, the funny thing about it was myself and two co-founders, we got into this simply by solving our own problem, not with any notion that we were being disruptive or even understanding this issue of trust. We were simply trying to pay our rent. Disruption doesn't have to mean bursting through the doors of an industry like the Kool-Aid man. I mean, sure, you could rip out all the walls on the first story of your house and make the entire thing an open concept, but that sounds like a lot of trouble for not a lot of reward. Disruption can be subtle and simple, like changing the way people think about something you love. I never really set out to create any form of disruption. I really just set out to solve a problem. And of course, you know, that is how a lot of the disruptions start out. And that's how a lot of the entrepreneurs start out. They have a problem or, or they see something and they think I can do that better. And so as a six-year-old, to me, this problem was a pressing issue that my friends didn't enjoy coding as much as I did. And at the time, I couldn't really find many fun tools, nonetheless, board games, right, that would make coding engaging. And the few that were existent were not thorough enough in teaching to code. So I went on to develop my own entertaining and comprehensive board game through which I could prove to my friends how fun coding can be. And, you know, I'm very grateful for all the disruption that I've been able to make with my creations now practically changing the perspective of many young people. And many of these changed minds have been through my workshops. But when I first started holding my workshops, I noticed that very few girls were attending the coding workshops that I was teaching. So I began to hold workshops dedicated towards girls only to make them feel more welcome. Because through firsthand experience, I know that when girls sort of see themselves in a room filled with other girls doing the same thing, they're all motivated and, and lifted up, believing that they all can achieve this big goal. But, but circling back to the question, I don't think any of my disruption was intended. Rather, they were driven by a sense of solving problems. I, I saw a problem and I felt as though I could do something to help combat them. I absolutely agree with, you know, oftentimes people ask, you know, how did you have the confidence to kind of stick with the path you were on when people didn't really get it? Certainly in the beginning, they didn't get it, uh, this idea of a stranger staying in your home. And I think the answer is simply twofold. And, and she said it well, you know, you're having fun while you're doing this. You know, you're, you're kind of pursuing your passion. Again, we didn't create like a proper business plan when we set out to do this. We had simply been trying to solve a problem one weekend and then we came out, kind of ran with it, largely because the three of us were good friends and wanted to work on something together. And then the second bit is as you go through the motions and you start having impact and you see how it impacts people, that's what gives you the faith that you're onto something. When you know the kind of impact that your product is having on people's lives, you know, you understand that better than anyone on the outside. And as long as you don't lose sight of that, you can understand why someone who isn't as close to it as you, you know, might not yet understand. But if, if you yourself have been that close to the impact, it can give you a lot of confidence. Disrupting an industry is more than just coming onto the scene with a bunch of new ideas and a willingness to shake things up. To hear Nate and Samira talk about it, it can happen almost by accident, a product of unique experiences and intense passion. What's tricky isn't changing the business landscape, it's changing people's minds. I think that this sort of ideology or maybe that, that preconceived notion that people may have about coding is something that's hard to change because, you know, it's the way that they have been thinking for a long time. And that's why one of my biggest goals was to be able to simplify coding and make it into a board game. I mean, who doesn't enjoy a board game? To make it into a way where people do enjoy it. And a lot of that was, you know, getting feedback from people like my friends, the people who will be using the game, the people at that younger age, and constantly using their feedback to improve. So from your target audience, constantly, you know, taking feedback from them and always reapplying that feedback into your work was one of the best ways for me to keep going forward. And Nate, you've, I think, faced a challenge that, while it's not obviously similar, I actually think is deeply similar. You had to take someone and get them 
to open their home to a stranger. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this joke on the internet, right? That, that in the 90s, they said, don't get into cars with strangers and don't meet people you'd meet on the internet. And now we call someone on, on the internet to get into their car. You had to do it with their homes. And so I think you had to shift this preconceived notion of the home as a place that you keep strangers out into one that you welcome people in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the common thing people would tell us is that, you know, how can I trust a stranger? And, you know, one of our early hosts, you know, had an interesting answer. He said, you know, a stranger is just a friend I haven't met yet. And we would do these experiments when we were meeting with investors and, and other folks early on when they said, you know, how are you going to solve this trust problem? How can you trust strangers? Well, we said, OK, so you, you wouldn't share your home with just anybody. But, you know, would you share it with somebody that you went to school with? Would you share it with someone who is in town for this reason? You know, the minute you started to contextualize it and it became clear kind of this is like a real person who's maybe not so different from yourself, people become much more comfortable than in the total abstract. This is World Reimagined with Gotham Makunda. This podcast is brought to you by TD Ameritrade. As a leader, you're constantly looking for ways to improve your skills so you can confidently manage new challenges and opportunities. It should be no different when it comes to investing. At TD Ameritrade, we provide you with the tools, support, and education you need to do one thing. Become a smarter, more confident investor. Learn more at tdameritrade.com. TD Ameritrade, where smart investors get smarter. Member SIPC. In 2016, Jonas Kaplan, a psychologist at the University of Southern California, used an MRI to measure the activity in people's brains while they were fed statements that contradicted their view of the world. When presented with contrary arguments to general knowledge statements such as Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, their brains were relatively calm. But when presented with arguments that ran counter to deeply held political convictions, there was a marked increase in a part of the brain known as the default mode network as well as in the amygdala. The first one regulates notions of identity, and the second one controls negative emotions. In other words, our brains are wired to perceive contradictions to our beliefs as personal attacks. This is one reason why negative stereotypes and normative roles persist in society long after most of us can agree that they've outstayed their welcome. But it also explains why it's hard to persuade someone of something really important because the simple act of exposing us to new information can feel like an attack on our basic sense of who we are. And the downstream effects of our inherent slowness to come around are something Samira is very familiar with. I think, you know, it is really hard to change people's preconceived notions, especially about, you know, young girls, about young kids. It's really hard to change that. And so going back to what I said way earlier about, you know, fewer girls attending my coding workshops, you know, at first this was extremely surprising. But now I look back and I, I think I can understand why. Because the thing is, you know, girls don't inherently lose interest in STEM fields, but rather I think it's something that builds upon time. When I was five years old, I wanted to be this scientist when I grew up. And so my dad gifted me a big science kit for my birthday, and it was the best present that I'd received. I spent a lot of time working on projects from those science kits. You know, I created slime and I learned about polymers and I created soda geysers and I learned about chemical reactions. I built model airplanes and I created these car tracks out of cardboard. I loved creating. And I think like me, approximately two thirds of girls are interested in science until the fourth grade. However, something happens in middle school that leads to a sharp decline for girls' interests in STEM. And I think that this is because by just about the fourth grade, a girl has seen enough of the world to know what society wants her to do. And this is reflected in the places that, you know, they visit the most often, such as the girls' toy aisle. In fact, you know, even if we just take a moment to picture it, picture the girls' toy aisle, we probably imagine something pink, you know, aisles filled with dolls and princesses. And this is a perfect example of societal gender bias and expectations because from a young age, we girls are taught to like princesses and, and be them. And, and while there's nothing wrong with this, you know, girls have so much more potential. And I truly believe that this ideology is not a biological trait 
because I grew up loving science and engineering, but rather it's a cultural norm. It's a example of the discrimination based on gender that's embedded in the regulations of society. But, you know, it's almost always been this way, like forever. Nothing has changed because our world today almost always favors the status quo. It favors the existing conditions and and the preconceived notions. So I truly believe, as, as, as uh, we circle back to the question, that changing that mindset, changing those preconceived notions are by far one of the hardest things to change. The legendary psychologist Dean Simonton looked at leaders in a wide variety of fields and assessed their capabilities and cognition. What was the strongest predictor of success he found? Their cognitive complexity, the extent to which they were able to interpret the world as a large number of interrelated variables. To be a good leader, you need to look beyond a simplistic interpretation of the world and see what your customers and your team can really bring to the table, regardless of their background. But you also need to do away with, or at least examine very, very closely, the notions you have about yourself as well. Especially your relationship with one of the topics leaders are often most reluctant to discuss. Failure. Because if you want to do something big, you have to be willing to fail. And if you don't want to do something big, well, what's the point of spending your life on small things? After all, as the great John Lewis always said, you only pass this way once. You got to give it all you can. Look, doing this is not without risk. And risk means risk of failure. And one thing I've learned over the years, as I've done you know, many projects and, and, and kind of many attempts at business, even outside the scope of Airbnb, is that you know, failure is simply a learning opportunity, right? And so if you have that mindset, if you accept the fact that even if you fail, you're going to learn in the process and if you're persistent enough to keep trying, then all that learning will pay dividends in the long term. And so, you know, that's another thing I, I like to tell people who are nervous about whether it's going to work or not. I mean, it is a good question, but as long as you're confident that you're going to learn something in the process, and as long as you're confident that, you know, you have a long time horizon in terms of applying those learnings to your career, to your, to your entrepreneurship, then, you know, it's going to be time well spent. I definitely agree. I I think that, you know, I look at it like mistakes are proof that you're trying. Only the people who will work hard, who will go for it, are the people who are going to make mistakes. And it's important to use those mistakes and those failures as building blocks and reapply it to create a path that will lead you to success. But it always takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of persistence and a lot of patience. And the whole process may take longer than you think. And you may have to change your path. You may have to modify or change the goal, but you definitely don't have to give up. And I truly believe that all of the persistence and hard work will always pay off. I know Clay once told me when he was encouraging me to do a a research agenda that most people did not think was wise, that he said, you know, look, at least if you fall, at least you're still moving forward. Absolutely. Changing the way we as leaders look at failure is important because it changes the way we look at ourselves and our experiences. By recontextualizing the decisions we made that didn't go right, by changing our perceived notions of what it means to fail, we not only disrupt the way we view the world outwardly, but the way we look inwardly too. The first year was very difficult. And one of the mistakes we made during that period was we were kind of optimizing for growth and not product market fit. Said another way, you know, we thought we were building an internet business and therefore the answers were about writing code and driving signups, incentivizing signups. And after the first year, we got accepted into a program called Y Combinator, you know, a very famous now kind of accelerator program for new companies. And one of the first pieces of advice that we got from Paul Graham, who's one of the founders, was that it's okay to do things that don't scale. I know you're trying to build an internet business, but it's okay to do things that don't scale when you're trying to find product market fit. More specifically, you should actually go out and meet your users. Again, you know, as an internet business, you can't meet every single user as you scale. But in the early days, when your users are in the dozens or hundreds, there's no reason why you can't go out and meet them. That was counterintuitive to us because, frankly, we didn't have the money to even buy a plane ticket. (laughs) But with that encouragement, 
we scrounged up the money and we were flying to New York and we were trying to meet every single user we had in New York. And there was only about 50 of them. So it wasn't a large number. It was a feasible number. And so, yeah, I think one of the learnings we had during this period was um, to meet your users. It's okay to do things that don't scale, even though you're trying to build up an internet business. And in doing so and meeting your, your users, you can perfect the product market fit. You can more quickly have a feedback loop where you're getting insights from customers and iterating on the product. Whereas we had otherwise been trying to create basically incentive schemes, uh, coupons and affiliate programs to drive traffic into a product that you know fundamentally wasn't where it needed to be. I love to find kind of like similarities between my two guests. And what struck me here is that each of you has, uh, has approached did what you just said, what I think of as one of the greatest challenges of leadership, right? Which is understanding people who are different from you, right? That Nate, you used a series of technological and social solutions to try and understand people who didn't necessarily think as stranger as a friend I haven't made yet and generate in them those change, right? To put yourself in their shoes. So Myra, you did that with, with board games to understand you were able to put yourself into the shoes of people who weren't like you and then use that understanding to help them in a pretty powerful way. Do you think about that deliberately? Do you have a strategy where you're like, no, this is how I try to understand someone who's very different from me? Or is it an intuitive process? I think for me, it's more of an intuitive process, right? I... I see somebody who may not agree with me, who may have different beliefs than me. And, you know, when it comes to coding, it's like they don't enjoy coding or they think it's boring or it's hard or it's frustrating. And then there's people like me who think that coding is fun and it's where you can create your own solutions and build your own games and apps. Or at least as a seven year old, that was my mentality. And it was this process of, well, can I make it fun for them? Right. These are some of my best friends who think that coding is hard and boring. And it's here I am truly enjoying this process. Is there a way that maybe I can make it fun for them so that we can code together? We can create these apps and games together. And so it was the process of taking something that my friends already did like, which were board games, and through that, proving to them how fun coding can be. And so I took this complex, intricate Thing called coding. And I basically dumped it onto a board game. I took the concepts behind how coding works and I sort of intertwined that into an adventure through which my friends would be playing a board game. But as they move the certain steps or as they play their cards, they'll be learning about various concepts that are applicable in real world computer science. And so it was this process of just, hey, my friends don't like coding. I like coding. Can I do something to make it fun for them? And this process of wanting to be able to connect with some of my favorite people and make something that I love so much, something that they can love so much as well. Great leaders challenge us to question our views of the world, our projects, and ourselves. And I wanted to know who had done that for Nate and Samira. Who in their lives had most impressed them and why? Well, there's two actually, and they're my co-founders, <laughs> Joe and Brian. And, you know, I say that because, I mean, obviously the three of us have created this company and gone on this remarkable journey over the last 14 years. And we're both, all three of us are still fully engaged in the company, but I honestly don't think any of this would have happened had any one of us not been a part of the team. I think there's just this incredible complementary nature to what we each bring. You know, I, I really believe no one person has it all. My background, as I mentioned earlier, is in engineering. I'm great at building things and kind of all things technical. Um, but my two co-founders are designers by background. And so we've often said that, you know, our relationship is a, kind of a marriage between art and science. You know, even the two of them are quite different. Brian is kind of incredibly kind of bold in his thinking. He always makes you ask for 10x what you think you can do and pushes you. But in doing so, brings out your best. And Joe just brings incredible kind of compassion to any undertaking uh, and perfectionism, you know, really wanting to understand the end user, how it holistically impacts them and apply that. You know, I've got to say that these different perspectives actually lead to a fair amount of conflict, <laughs> especially in the earlier days when things weren't going well. We often disagreed, but we very quickly also realized that by finding compromise, by finding the intersection 
of our three different views, that that middle ground, you know, always represented kind of the best path forward. And so, you know, I've learned so much from my two other co-founders. Uh, and I think it's a big part of the success of Airbnb. Well, thanks so much. And Samira, same question for you. Yeah, I think, you know, I've gotten the opportunity to meet or encounter so many influential people throughout my few years. But I'd still say the most influential people in my life would definitely have to be my family. My dad was the one who introduced me to coding in the first place. And so really none of this would be possible without him. And my my mom is one of the coolest people I know. She's a rehabilitation counselor. So she basically gets to help people improve their lives and overcome challenges for a living. She always helps me learn and grow as a person while making sure that I'm always taken care of. And my parents have always given me the liberty to do whatever I wanted. So they never really established any rules in the house. Rather, they led by example. So they never taught me to be bold or to be kind or to be compassionate. Rather, they were bold, kind, and compassionate. And those traits were picked up by my younger brother and I. And speaking of my younger brother, who's 10 and however annoying, he is truly an influential person in my life. Um, he's funny and he's an amazing soccer player and he always lets me test out my new ideas on him. All of my inventions have meaningful edits made to them due to his feedback. And I honestly don't know where I'd be without all three of them. Thanks so much for that. Uh, so I would just say this is forever, so your younger brother will be able to use this against you at any time in the future. <laughs> If you've ever shopped for a house, even for fun, you've probably noticed how frequently they're staged. Realtors will set up homes as if someone was living there already, because research shows people are more likely to buy a place if they can picture themselves in it. But if the chairs and tables and artwork are already arranged just so, are you seeing the house? Or are you seeing how someone else sees it? Admittedly, there's something daunting about a truly empty home. A blank slate has a gravity to it. It's easy to see the future when it's bounded by customs, or history, or couches. All the changes are on you and other people, be they your family, your roommates, or your team, will know it's your decisions that shaped the way things are. But an empty house is also an opportunity for innovation, for creativity. And by looking at it as a fresh start, you can see beyond other people's preconceived ideas and make something new. What this place is, what it can be, is entirely in your control. After all, most people probably thought they knew what air mattresses and coding workshops were, too. Maybe this house would be better with a window in that far wall. Or without the kitchen island. Or a whole new vegetable garden where the backyard used to be. It would take work it would certainly be disruptive. But if you want something that feels like home, you're going to need to embrace that blank slate. World Reimagined with Gotham Makunda, a leadership podcast for a changing world. An original podcast from NASDAQ. Visit the World Reimagined website at nasdaq.com slash World Reimagined Podcast. Gotham Makunda does not speak on behalf of Rose Park Advisors, LLC, or any of its affiliates, and is not soliciting investments or providing investment advice. 